The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. It was by the Sea of Tiberias, and it happened like this. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. The sons of Zebedee and two more of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. They replied, we'll come with you. They went out and got into the boat, but caught nothing that night. It was light by now, and there stood Jesus on the shore, though the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus called out, have you caught anything, friends? And when they answered, no, he said, throw out the red the net to starboard and you will find something. So they dropped the net and there were so many fish that they could not haul it in. The disciples, the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. At these words, it is the Lord. Simon Peter, who had practically nothing on, wrapped his cloak round him and jumped into the water. The other disciples came on in the boat towing the net and the fish. They were only about a hundred yards from land. As soon as they came ashore, they saw that there was some bread there and a charcoal fire with fish cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter went ab aboard and dragged the net to the shore, full of big fish, 153 of them. And in spite of there being so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples was bold enough to ask, who are you? They knew quite well it was the Lord. Jesus then stepped forward, took the bread and gave it to them, and the same with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after rising from the dead. After the meal, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Look after my sheep. Then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I tell you most solemnly, when you were young, you put on your own belt and walked where you liked. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will put a belt around you and take you where you would rather not go. In these words, he indicated the kind of death by which Peter would give glory to God. After this, he said, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever. So after the resurrection, Jesus, or Peter goes fishing. You know, it's sort of an, an odd thing to do. What are we to make of that? It seems like a, a, a strange thing, perhaps. Is Peter, St. Peter returning to his prior life? Is he abandoning his vocation? Has he somehow lost hope? Has he forgotten that he's supposed to be an apostle? Well, in the gospel, we don't see that Jesus rebukes him. Rather, he helps him to make a miraculous catch of fish. So it seems that Jesus did want was happy with the fact that Peter went fishing. And I think it's St. Gregory the Great who explains in a homily that what was not a sin for Peter before he became an apostle did not thereby become a sin after he was an apostle. So it was not wrong for Peter to go fishing. And indeed, you know, we have this miraculous catch which suggests that it was very much to God's purpose for him to go fishing. 
We can think of, of St. Paul, another apostle, an apostle who sustained himself or who supported himself by working as a tent maker. And there was, and perhaps St. Peter meant to do the same by going fishing. There was not yet a church to, uh, to support him, nor much, so much apostolic work to do at this point that he could not uh, support himself. Previously, when he was following Jesus around the Holy Land and was not going fishing, so far as we know, there were many disciples who supported the apostles. But at this time, you know, after the resurrection and, and before Pentecost, there are a few who, who follow Jesus. There are a few who are still with the apostles. So we see that he goes fishing along with some other apostles. But our Lord uses this to teach him some things about his vocation. Remember that this period between the resurrection and the ascension was the time in which the apostles were taught many things regarding their mission. They were prepared to, uh, to be the, 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 the foundation of the church together with, uh, with Christ. And you know, consequently, you know, if we think about the grace of this liturgical period, the liturgy that renders present what was uh, past in order that we may share in its grace, the, the grace of this liturgical period is especially that of deepening our understanding of the faith and especially of our faith in the, in the sacraments. We might think just you know, briefly here, uh, since we're at Nazareth, of, of, the, of the Eucharist and the, the connection that it has with the Annunciation. You know, that uh, as Mary you know, received the, Jesus in her body, received the Word of God in her. And so we, with the in the Holy Eucharist, receive, the, receive God in our body. And so, no, very fittingly, we can meditate on the Annunciation after we've, uh, after we've received the, the Holy Communion. And in that moment, no, uh, adore God, as, as, uh, or ask Mary to help us to, to adore God as, as she did after the, after the Incarnation, after the Annunciation. And we can also think of the, the great reverence with which she received our, our, our Lord. And uh, thus, no, also when we receive uh, communion. It's, uh, I, yeah, I just sort of like to make a, a brief mention of, of uh, the, the way we, re we receive communion. Uh, sometimes we, we aren't uh, altogether uh, aware of uh, the the fact that, that Jesus is, uh, is present in every little uh, fragment, in every little uh, crumb that might, might be of the, of the, the host. You know, when the, the host is broken into two pieces, the Jesus is equally present in, in both of them. And he's present even in the, in the smallest fragments. So if we receive communion in the, if we choose to receive communion in the hand, we should do, do it as, as uh, St. Cyril of, of Jerusalem taught his, his catechumens to do it, you know, to make a a thrown out of their hands, to put the one hand on top and the other hand beneath. And think of this as a, a throne where our, our Lord will be placed. And then uh, after having you know, reverently received our, our Lord, to, to just make sure that there are no uh, fragments left on the, on the hand. This is St. Cyril of, of Jerusalem says that uh, you know, if uh, I were to place gold in your hand, you would be very concerned to, to not uh, lose any, any tiny piece of it. And, and so it is also with our Lord, who is far more precious than, than gold. But in turning back to the gospel, we have, we have these, uh, these elements in it. We have this miraculous catch of fish, and then we have an appearance of our risen Lord, or at least, no, he's recognized after the miraculous catch. Then there's a meal and the reintegration of St. Peter. And finally, the prophecy of Peter's martyrdom. So starting from that miraculous catch of fish, this uh, miraculous catch is different from the former one. Now, there was another miraculous catch at the beginning when uh, St. Peter was called to follow Christ, to leave everything and follow him. And then St. Peter, overwhelmed by the miracle, left everything to become a fisher of men. It's like that one in that it makes St. Peter progress in his vocation, progress in his vocation, understand better what it is that God wants him to do. And yet, it is unlike it in some other ways. And then, Jesus was in Peter's bark. And now, Jesus is not in Peter's bark, but he is on the shore. Now, what, does, what does that mean? Now, in St. John's Gospel, the, the details that he records, he records to a particular purpose. Now, John has 
meditated these, these things, contemplated them for his entire life. And when he records something that might seem an in insignificant detail, he really uh, means it to be contemplated, to be understood that there are symbolic meanings in, the, in these things that happen. And so, now what does, does it mean that, Peter, or that uh, Jesus is now on the shore? No. Before Jesus walked beside Peter, the two of them were walking together on earth. But now Peter is being prepared for a time when our Lord will be in heaven, which is in a way like the, like the shore, as the sea is uh, to the turbulent and unstable world in which we live. Now this is uh, a comparison that the, the fathers of the church make. Now in our, we are in a, a troubled uh, world and trying to make our way to the shore, to the peace uh, of heaven. And so, you know, that's what it means for, for Jesus to be standing on the shore, is that Jesus is, is in heaven waiting for us and, and calling to us and, and guiding us in our journey. Now, and so there are, there are other differences we can note. Now, the first time, the full nets, the nets were so full that they were breaking, but, and so they, they put the fish into the boats. But now that the net does not break, even though it's so full that it uh, cannot be pulled into the boat, but has to be towed to shore, where then St. Peter pulls the net to shore. And what did we say the shore is? Well, that's heaven. So we see St. Peter pulling the fish to shore, pulling the fish who in, in other parables represent uh, those who enter the church. And whereas before the the, uh, the synagogue was, was weak. It would, it would break like those nets were breaking before. Now the, the church is, is stronger. It can contain uh, all of the fish. It can contain all those who enter the church without, uh, without breaking, without uh, any rupture in unity, without any rupture in communion. And even things like this number of 153 fish, certainly a very great number of fish, but the he doesn't just say a very great number of fish, he says 153. And the, the fathers of the, the church tell us also that 153 was the, the number of, of species of fish that were then known in the world. So this is a number which expresses universality, how all people can, can enter into the church and still it will, it will not break, still its communion can hold. And uh, even the fact that the nets are, have to be thrown out to starboard has its meaning, you know, the, on the right side of the boat. On the, the boat, if the boat is, is the bark of Peter, the bark of Peter is the church, and the church is the body of Christ. What is on the right side of the body of Christ? You know, what is, when we, we see the, uh, very often the crucifixion represented, on the right side of Christ is Our Lady. And so this could be a, an indication that uh, in order for our apostle to be successful, in order for us to truly catch fish, we must cast it to starboard. We must go to Our Lady in order to bring into the church those whom God calls. Now, after this miraculous catch, we have the recognition that it is the Lord, you know, that it is the risen Lord who is there. And at that first miraculous catch, it was Peter who fell to his knees in recognition of the divine power at work and of his own sinfulness before this uh, manifestation of God. Now, however, it is the beloved disciple who recognizes the Lord. So we know by faith, and we open ourselves to the gift of faith by humility, as Peter did when he confessed his sinfulness. But the, the knowledge of God is perfected by charity when it comes to know what is inexpressible, what we, we can't quite grasp in, in concepts, but somehow can know by, by love is the beloved disciple recognize the Lord by that love, that charity which he had toward him. Now, when the disciples have reached the shore, we find that there's a meal, and that at this meal, the apostles all know that it is the Lord. So we have a, a meal after the resurrection at which the apostles all know that it is the Lord. And we have our Lord breaking bread and giving it to them. So this, is, this recalls to us the, the episode of Emmaus, they, how the, the two disciples knew our Lord in the breaking of the bread. So this meal is something like the Eucharist. And the Eucharist as a, is a meal, as Pope Benedict reminded us, first of all because it is a sacrifice, and the meal is a sharing in the sacrifice, which affects a, a communion with the God to whom the sacrifice is offered. 
But this meal, which uh, is somewhat like the, uni like the Eucharist, is off eaten on shore, you know, which we said represents heaven. So this could be uh, a meal. This meal has a sort of eschatological dimension. It, it speaks about the, the end, about the, the state of, uh, of perfection. You know? and so the Eucharist is a foretaste of the, of the beatific vision, a foretaste of the beatific vision, which is indeed the bread of angels. And so the Eucharist is also the bread of angels, as the angels feast themselves on the, on the vision of God, on the vision of, of Christ in glory. And so you know, we can share in some way in this when we receive the Eucharist here, as Our, Our Lady received God in, in her in the, uh, in the Annunciation. And so, you know, we can say, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. There's a point in the, in the gospel where someone exclaims that in, in Luke 14, but you can, can look that up later. But the church is the, the kingdom of God, and yet it has not reached yet its fullness, which will happen only at the end of time in the, in the eschaton. Yeah. And you know, going forward another step here, now that we have had the risen Lord recognized by charity, now that we have had a meal that has a, a reference to the Eucharist, which we could say is when we receive charity itself made flesh, for God is charity and our, our Lady, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, made God the Word flesh. So the Eucharist is charity made flesh and the memorial of the greatest charity known among men, of that sacrifice to give one's life, to lay down one's life for a friend. And so we have charity recurring over and over again. And what comes next? St. Peter has to be prepared to be the, the first pope. You know, he has to be prepared for the, the day of Pentecost when the church will, uh, will be born. And the, the pope, as our, our present Holy Father says, and as the, the fathers said, uh, many, you know, the, the fathers of the church said in the, in the early centuries, the pope must preside in charity. You know? So again, charity. And yet he has denied our Lord three times. And so to heal this, our Lord calls him three times to love. Peter, however, does not seem quite to understand what sort of love our, our Lord is speaking of, because, well, we see that partly, you know, the, the, the replies of Peter don't quite come up to the standard that Jesus is, is calling him to. You know, Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me more than all of these? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, do you know, do I know that you love me more than all of these? Because, and we see this even more in the, in the Greek. Obviously, you know, St. Peter and, and Jesus weren't speaking Greek to one another. So this is something that our, uh, that, that St. John is, is drawing out and expressing in the Greek, something that was, was only implicit in the words that, uh, that Peter and, and uh, Jesus were using that day. No, there's a, a distinction. The word that Jesus uses when, uh, when he asks, do you love me, is, no, comes from agape, no, a charity. Whereas the word that Peter uses when he replies comes from philos, no, uh, the love of a, of a friend. And so, no, Jesus asks him, do you love me truly with charity? And Peter says, yes, I, I know, you know I love you as a friend. Well, that's not quite the same thing, is it? No. He has to, to, he's being called to, to do more, to love uh, more perfectly, to grow in love. And you know, that this has to do with, with Peter's uh, primacy, we see not only by the fact that he's called to, to feed the, the sheep, to, to care for the flock uh, of Christ, the flock of, the, of Christ, which is the, the church, you know, as the Pope is the, the supreme pastor, but also, you know, the, what, what is uh, Peter called here? You know, he's called Simon, son of John. Where have we heard uh, Peter or Simon called in, in reference to his father's name? We find that in, in Matthew 16, 17. You know, Simon, uh, you are Simon, Simon, son of Jonah. You are rock, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. You know, so again, this has to do with, with Peter's uh, primacy, with his primacy which is to preside in the uh, to preside in, in charity, and so uh, in order to be worthy of, of this vocation, certainly you know, a, a pope is is still pope even if he's very much lacking in charity. Fortunately, we have holy popes in in the last couple of centuries, but you no. Know, in order to to worthily uh, be pope, 
really calls for, for charity, for, to, to preside in charity, to, to be very much a holy example for the whole flock. And you know, Jesus you know, asked him, you know, do you love me in charity? And again, do you love me in charity? And the third time, well, he settles for the love that, that, uh, that Peter uh, manages to give him. You know, he changes his word to, to match the word that, that, uh, that Peter is using. No, for, for now, that's enough. But then he talks about the future. No, we, although God in, in his mercy will settle for us being for the moment the way that we are, he does not want us to remain that way. He wants us always to grow in charity, to grow in holiness. And so he, he speaks of, of the end for Peter, of the, the end, the, the heights of love to which he must grow, and speaks of prophesying St. Peter's martyrdom something that Peter probably does not understand then, but, but will come to understand later when these events begin to, to take place, when he finds himself uh, bound and led where he does not wish to go. And so, mm, summing this up, you know, we could say that the, the key word in today's Gospel is love, that, and not just any love, but indeed in charity, that in charity which must uh, drive us to, to love uh, God and neighbor, even so much that uh, we conform ourselves to the will of God, even uh, unto death, you know, even unto to martyrdom, should it uh, come to that, which you know, perhaps is not likely, but we should all uh, try to be, to be prepared for that, to be uh, you know, something that we can do, surely only with God's grace. But we must always seek to, to grow in charity, to grow in our conformity to the will of God, and to be ever more like, uh, more like Christ. So let us pray that our, our Lady may help us to, to do this, to receive uh, the Eucharist, God who is charity, and to grow ever more perfect in this holy virtue. Praised be Jesus and Mary.